next speaker, we have Daniel Stillman, conversation designer at the Conversation Factory. Daniel, are you ready? The stage is yours. Thank you so much. I think I am. Can you hear me? <laughs> I was muted by the host. I hope you can all hear me now. Sweet. Hey, everyone. Uh, like Josh said, my name is Daniel Stillman. I have a company called The Conversation Factory, where it, uh, I interview people about how they design conversations that matter. I've been doing this for a couple of years. I'm going to talk about that, some ideas about how to design conversations that matter. If you want to download a couple of free chapters of my uh, my, my recent book, you can just head over to theconversationfactory.com slash good talk, and you should be able to grab those. And so uh, I see conversations. I don't know if you've seen this movie. It's a vintage one. I actually never saw it because I heard about the spoiler before it came out. And I was like, what's the point? But the takeaway for me is I see conversations everywhere. And if there's any wisdom in the book, it's because of all the amazing people that I've been interviewing on my podcast the last couple of years. I've really been trying to unpack this idea of what conversations are made of and how we can design them better. Generally, what I see is people over designing conversations. This is, if you Google what millennials are ruining, you'll find many, many things that Google will autocomplete for you. One of the things that millennials are apparently ruining are marriage proposals. This is a cell phone case where you can embed the ring in the cell phone case and then pop it out as you pop the question. I don't wanna yuck someone else's yum but I do think this is kind of gross. I don't like that much technology as the interface between me and the person that I'm trying to communicate with. I also see people misdesigning conversations. I love this New Yorker cartoon where this guy in the suit is like just totally misusing a post-it note and you can see everybody's disengaged. Everybody's leaning back. He's doing all the work. They're just sitting back and just being disengaged. There are better ways to design team dialogues. So first of all, let's talk about design. To design, and this is a definition from Herb Simon, who is a Nobel laureate in economics. He defines design very broadly to devising courses of action that are aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. And if we put this in plain language, it just means making things better on purpose. Most of us in our jobs are paid to make things better on purpose. You can get away with making things better by accident. Sometimes most of us can't make things worse on purpose and stay paid. So design is core to almost everything that we do. So why do conversations need to be designed? And why do conversations matter? First of all, I'll just say our lives are literally built one conversation at a time. Our lives are defined by the conversations we can and can't have. And also our organizations and our teams are, are defined by the conversations they can and can't have. If you don't take my word for it, you can definitely take Ed Catmull's word for it. Uh, he's now president of Walt Disney Animation. This I love this quote, if there's more truth in the hallways, then in meetings, you have a problem. But if you can't even talk about things in the hallways, you've got an even bigger problem. I said that. That's me, not Ed Catmull. What conversations need to be designed? And, I, and I'd invite you to think about this for yourself. Think about all the conversations, large and small, in your work and in your home life, which ones need to become better on purpose. When I ask people this question, I often get things like offsites, stand-ups, check-ins, one-on-ones, family meetings, coaching calls, all hands, brainstorms, workshops, or cheats, culture. And these are all conversations I have helped people to design thoughtfully and reflectively. Let's also talk about it, what, what it means for something to matter. Matter means it has impact. What impact do we need them to have? Let's think about, think about all those conversations that in your life that need to be redesigned or shifted. What kind of impact do you want them to have? What kind of impact do the rest of the people who are in the conversation want it to have? 
So let's dive really deeply into design. I come from an industrial design background. And so I'm really passionate about material design. And if there's one thing I learned in design school, it's that the material affects the design. So if you have some clay and you're making a pot, it will be different than if you have some glass or metal or wood and you try to make the same pot. And so there is definitely a design that you are framing and making. And there's also a designer, the person shaping that material, which is clay. So we have these three components of the design, the designer, and the material that are in interplay in material design. Now, after a couple of years in industrial design, I transitioned into user experience design where you're definitely designing stuff and there's definitely designers, but the material is harder to touch and feel. When you're a user experience designer, you're not designing in code and you're definitely not delivering paper and pins and string to the customer, but they're definitely designing here. They're designing flows. They're designing uh, arcs of experience. They're designing with a customer in mind. So it's worth asking what material you are designing with when you are designing the conversations you design. I know this is a lot of layers and we're gonna, we're gonna parse it back and we're gonna peel it layer by layer. I want you to understand what the levers of design that are available to us, you and me, in the conversations that we design. In order to be aware of those levers, we have to be able to discuss, to talk about, to identify what conversations are made of so that we can treat conversations like clay and mold them. So the best way I know to do that is by drawing a conversation. I've been peeling back the layers of conversations, as I said, on my podcast and in the book. And there are people, there are turns taken, there are goals, there are spaces and places where conversations happen. And if we break it down, uh, there are at least nine key levers of conversation design, but I have, two or three or four that I wanna really focus on in today's conversation. One is the interface, which is where the conversation happens. Conversations have a space and a place and the space and place defines them and shapes them. We're also gonna talk about turn-taking, which is about who talks when. If you're talking about distributed teams and team design, the rituals of turn-taking are absolutely, absolutely essential. And then we also need to talk about the people in the conversation. Who do we include and why? And then finally, I want to talk about power and power dynamics. At the core of this is really belonging and diversity. So let's talk about interfaces. If you can shift the interface of a conversation, you can shift the nature of the conversation. So imagine having your boardrooms at the beach, right? the uh, openness and energy versus the durability and flexibility of the conversation is very different. Post-it notes would definitely fly all around at the beach, but there would be a lot of energy and excitement for being outside. So I wanna tell you a story of changing spaces to change a conversation. I, I walked into a client of mine, this is years ago, and they'd set up the workshop space in this classic you and there was a projector on that middle table and this really said sage on the stage and that was not the intention of the workshop it was a collaborative interactive workshop i generally don't use a lot of slides in my workshop so i didn't even need the projector so during the break i rotated that middle table and swung the chairs around and when everyone walked back in from the break the room looked the same at first glance, but it felt really different. Everyone was like, whoa, what did you change? What's different? They felt it before they could see it, which I think is fascinating and extraordinary. So what changed? What changed is the relational capacity of the space. Which space is right? It has to do with your goals, your intention. My goal was interactivity, not presenting. 
right? And so I changed the space to suit my goals. How else can we redesign our conversation spaces? Well, when we're having conversations online, when we're distributed, we're not having them in boardrooms, we're having them in digital spaces. And so it seems trivial to say this, but we have to be doing our work in spaces that work for everyone. Just in the same way that our buildings need to be accessible for people in wheelchairs, our digital spaces need to be accessible for everyone who is involved in the conversation. So you might be super duper excited by Notion. And I love Notion, it's a great tool. But I remember sharing a Notion page with a client I was collaborating with and they were like, wait, what is this? How do I use it? Can I get access to this? They had trouble logging on. And so having a tool that you're using where people have to log on to use it is kind of challenging. That's one reason why I love Mural. Mural does have links that you can share with someone so that they can access and utilize a space without having uh, a login at all. But people still find Mural a little scary if they've never used it before. And so there's nothing wrong with Google Docs. Google Docs is just simply not scary. It's a space you can have your conversations that generally works for almost everyone. Your mileage may vary. It's worth having the conversation with your team about where your conversations should happen. If everything is in one place, it's easy to find. If people can't locate it or if people are putting it in two different places, we can't find what we're talking about. This creates drag, it creates resistance. It slows the conversation down. It's non-trivial. I've seen so many clients I work for. I've worked for companies where one person was using one system to, tr to track to-dos and another person on the same team was using another and there's no alignment. And so having the conversation about where our conversations should take place are non-trivial. It's worth taking time to find a non-scary, fully accessible space that everybody can contribute and have dialogue on. So yeah, Google Docs, it's very effective. Uh, let's talk about turn-taking. This is one of my favorite elements of the conversation operating system. If you can shift turn-taking patterns, you can really change the conversation. There are a lot of default turn-taking patterns in group dialogues. And I'm gonna name a couple, maybe you've seen some of these before. Stop me if you've heard this. First speaker syndrome. So when somebody poses a question or a challenge, somebody in the group kind of tends to always weigh in first with their opinion. Extroverts, it's not their fault. We, we think out loud. It's how we operate. The challenge with first speaker syndrome is that it creates an anchoring bias. Whatever is said next is said in relationship to that first statement. Another default is ping pong conversations. Maybe you've been in a conversation like this where one person says, I think we should do this. Another person says, we should do this other thing. And a third person says, no, there's this other thing we can do. And people just go back and forth and back and forth. The conversation just spirals around and around. And uh, the real problem is somebody feels excluded from that ping pong match or begins to get disengaged because they just don't see the conversation going anywhere. One of the worst default conversation turn-taking patterns is opening and closing at the same time. So that's when somebody says, hey, what if we blanked? And somebody says, oh, we tried that last season. That doesn't work because it makes people die on the inside. Opening and closing at the same time is soul crushing. It's ineffective. If you want creativity, you need to generate lots of options and then select the options. This is really basic table stakes, but I see so many teams where people are allowed to generate and slaughter ideas simultaneously. It's super duper ineffective. So we can design a team conversation 
in order to shift default behaviors if we do it intentionally. So here are these three defaults we talked about, first speaker syndrome, ping pong conversations, and opening and closing at the same time. And there are at least three designs that can resolve those default challenges and give you a better design for your conversation. Talking alone before you talk together, that is the best way to defeat first speaker syndrome. I just always give people solo time, give everybody in the group, bake it into the process that everyone gets two or three minutes to think their thoughts, write it down on a piece of paper, and then put it in a shared Google Doc. Let, us, let everyone see what everyone else thinks. Give everyone a chance to marinate on the topic before we start popcorning. Ping pong conversations are easily redesigned using rounds. Rounds are just so simple, giving everyone the same amount of time to speak on a particular topic and to speak to the topic, not to someone else's perspective or point of view. And this is a really subtle point of rounds. This is everyone saying, here's the topic and everyone's speaking directly to that topic. I'm not responding to what the first or second or third person said. I'm stating my opinion and we're speaking to the center of the circle as we go around it. And then opening and closing at once, a terrible, terrible default in team conversations, being super super intentional about breaking up your time, whether it's 30 minutes or an hour or a day between opening, exploring, and closing. So diverging and converging, and in the middle, leaving time for emergence or for ideas to cross-pollinate and develop. Okay, Whew. let's take a deep breath. Throwing a lot of stuff at you. I'm very excited for the Q&A to see what parts of this resonate with you. The next element of the conversation operating system that I wanna break down as it relates to distributed teams and teamwork is people. With no people, there is no conversation. There are a couple of important corollaries of this fact. Conversations have size. When we add people to the conversation, the conversation shifts. It becomes more complex, more unruly, more difficult to manage. And that's why, uh, in, and that complexity happens surprisingly fast. So let's break this down. When you have two people in a conversation and you need to get to some agreement or alignment, you need two points to get crunched down into one. When you have three people, you have three to one. It's 50% more information. When you have six people, uh, Sorry, oh my God, I'm totally doing this. I'm reading the wrong part. When you have four people, you can see those little dots down here. These are the numbers of points of view that need to be collapsed into one. There's actually one, two, three, four, five, six points of view that need to be collapsed into one. And that's just if there's one topic that's being addressed. And so six to one is a, a big jump. And so when you add one more person to a small group, it's a huge shift. When you get to five people, it's 10 to one. Six people is 15 to one. So it's a really great idea to break out and come back. If you have a group that is larger than five, it is worth breaking up even into twos and threes to have sub conversations on a topic and then to come back. Uh, you need to be able to trust and empower smaller groups to decide. Use these smaller group sizes whenever you can. Don't just trust in the two pizza rule. If, if you've never heard of the two pizza rule, this is uh, Jeff Bezos's classic supposition that the ideal size for a team is the number of people that would be served by two pizzas. A pizza in the United States of America has about eight slices. That's 16 slices. I don't know, two slices a person, that's eight people. Eight is still a very, very large group of people. If you try to have an eight person conversation without regulating turn-taking using some of the features that we talked about earlier, like rounds, thinking alone and thinking together and opening, exploring and closing in sequence, 
you're going to run into trouble. And that's why it's always a good idea to break teams down into very small units whenever you can. Two pizzas is still a lot of people. So let's talk about power dynamics. This is a tough one because mm, I love this quote from Alice Walker. Uh, she's an American author. The most common way that people give up their power is by thinking that they don't have any. And the truth is that inside of a conversation, everyone has the power to speak. We actually can't take the power of speech away from people. We may not have authority over the conversation. We may not have authority to invite people in to the conversation or to cancel a meeting or to make people come to our conversation. But inside of a conversation, everyone has the ability to speak. And so this question of who feels like they belong, I don't know about you, but I don't speak if I don't feel like my voice matters. This is really critical. So we can be in the conversation, we can be invited to the meeting, we can have the physical ability to speak, but we will not speak if we don't feel like our voice matters. Now, this is a broad topic of mattering. If we don't feel like our ideas will be utilized or have anything done with them, we won't speak. If we feel like people won't appreciate or take up our ideas, we won't speak. If we feel like we're on the outside of the group looking in, we won't speak. And so this is why diversity and inclusion is so critical in conversations. Who can you bring into the conversation? This is about people and power. Who can we empower to be part of the conversation? Which stakeholders want a seat at the table? And how can we make them feel heard earlier? And once they're there at the table, how can we make them feel like it's safe to share their perspectives and their ideas? Furthermore, if we think about the people who we're empowering to be part of the conversation, are they in fact a diverse group of people? This is, uh, has always been critical and critically important, but it's even more important now uh, as people become uh, terribly and recently aware of the challenges uh, that we're having in the United States of America and around the world. Black lives definitely matter. And a lot of corporate systems are fairly exclusionary. And so when you're looking at your teams, if you're solving a problem for a group of people that don't look like you, it's really worthwhile having the conversation about making your team as diverse as the group of people that you serve. I'm gonna say that again, because I think it's really, really important and people kind of forget this challenge. The group of people solving a problem for another group of people can look like colonialism, for sure, for real. The group of people needs to resemble the group of people that they serve. And there are business reasons for this. There's plenty of evidence that shows that diverse groups of people tend to come up with better ideas, certainly more ideas, but resting your diversity efforts on an economic ec argument is missing a fair amount of the point. Diversity is good in and of itself, and it's important to bring voices from outside the organization in and to make sure that your customers aren't just heard, but actually have a seat at the table. And why is this? Um, this is one of my favorite diagrams. This is from an organization called IA. P2. And if we break down this diagram, it's about uh, engagement versus power given. So engagement increasing from uh, the bottom to the top and power increasing from the left to the right. Uh, at the bottom left is informing people. And you can see there's this big circle and it's just pushing out a message to lots of little circles. The lowest level of power given to a group 
outside of an organization and the lowest level of engagement is just the one to many informing. This is like webinars. This is like public notices and posters saying, this is what's happening, right? There's no uh, invitation for a loop of conversation. Moving up one level is consulting people. So I'm sure you've seen this in your neighborhood where you spot the poster that says that uh, public comments are welcomed for a certain number of weeks about a public works project that's in your neighborhood. I tend to see that poster well after that period has closed. And it's always kind of annoying to realize that my opportunity to be consulted has closed. And so consulting people uh, is only possible if we've informed them that it's possible for them to be heard. And so that's why we have that at least this two-way arrow between the little people and the big group that has the power over the project. So informing somebody is the lowest level. The next level of engagement is consulting, but that only works if people have been informed. Consulting is not as empowering or engaging as involving people. Uh, that's where the you can see the dots and involved are just getting a little bit larger. And so people want to be involved. This is why we uh, map stakeholders and it's worth thinking about who has a stake in the system and who would like to be more than informed and consulted, who would actually like to be involved in the decision-making process? Who would like to have a voice in what gets made or done? The next step up is collaboration. This is giving a lot more power to people outside of our circle. This is getting close to co-creation where there is no power differential between the us and the them from the people inside the organization and outside of the organization. In government, this is where we will actually do what the people decide. As a very, very high level of engagement, it's a very, very high level of giving power to others. And it takes a lot of bravery to be able to do it. But it's worth doing if you want to create a truly empowered team. Now this IAP2 uh, was designed specifically with public impact and public projects in mind but this works exactly the same inside of organizations and in teams and for projects. Very, very few people enjoy being informed about decisions that affect them and their daily lives. Everyone loves the opportunity to collaborate and to be empowered to shape and transform issues that have deep impact for them. So we've broken down these four elements of conversation design. Interface, which is about where it all happens. Turn-taking, which is who talks when, and it's super critical to work on that. People, who do we include? And then power, right? Which is all about belonging and inclusion. So, what we talked about, can we make the interface accessible and transparent with turn-taking um, and people and power? Oh, my animations are out of order. Can we make the turn-taking balanced and uh, mindful, purposeful? With the people in the group, can we play with the size of the group breaking it down into smaller units whenever possible to give people the opportunity to really think their own thoughts and to build up agreements naturally. And with power, can we foster authentic inclusion and diversity? Um, these are uh, the core ideas from uh, my book, Good Talk, which is all about how to design conversations that matter. Um, I would love to leave as much time as possible for questions and interaction with the group. Uh, if uh, 
Jao, if there's anything that's that's coming up in the in the chat, I'm I'm down to start unpacking stuff. Okay, let's do this. Let's start the Q and A then. Because I went fast. That's great. It gives us a lot of time to answer these questions. Are you ready? Oh, I was born ready. <laughs> when using the rounds design, isn't it natural that you still have the over the over extroverts speak for more time than the introverts? Is that an issue as well? Oh yeah, totally. Um, that's a great question, whoever asked it. And I definitely think that this is why time is important. A lot of people talk about this question of how do I deal with over talkers or under talkers? Over talkers and under talkers only exist if you haven't set the requirement that everyone uses the same amount of time. And that can mean getting a time timer and putting it in the center of the circle. Or if you're online, that means uh, using a Google timer and having it shared in one of the screens. I tend to use some light signaling. So it's time is one of those things where if you've got five minutes, it's kind of rude to just tell people, okay, you're out of time, five minutes is up, right? And so it's really a good idea to just tell people that they're halfway and they've got a minute left and then they're out of time. And to also ask if they need one more minute to, to finish what they're saying. And so that's about process and holding firmly on process, right? It's leaving it up to chance means that everyone has to be really respectful and really uh, be aware of the fact that everyone else is needs and deserves the same amount of time. And so, yeah, there are definitely people who are over talkers start with, uh, there's a, a ladder of intervention where the, the lowest level is uh, restricting choice and the upper level is removing choice. And there's a lot of things to do uh, at the bottom level of the ladder to make it easier to navigate that. So it's a great question. It, the rabbit hole goes really far down, even with such a, uh, it's a small detail, but that's, that's where the, the gods and the details. Next question. How can we help introverts join a team and understand that they matter and that they have the power to speak? Yeah, this is a really tough one because some of it has to do with inclusion and belonging, right? And so they may only be, I feel like a lot of introverts uh, are not, uh, there's a spectrum. There's a spectrum from introversion to extroversion. Like true extroverts, are very rare and true introverts are very rare. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. And so while extroverts do indeed uh, get energy from others and think out loud and introverts do need time alone and need time to think, everyone needs time to think. And everyone enjoys being around people that they like. Most introverts that I talk to say, oh, well, I'm much more relaxed and, and voluble, talkative around my friends. And I'm like, so am I. Everyone's like that. And so it's really about creating comfort. It's really essential to have an opportunity to warm up, to check in, to have a quick round where you set the ground rule that everyone is going to speak and everyone is going to share. I think it's also really helpful to have paper even if you're doing an online conversation, make sure everyone has a sticky note, a journal and a pen and just say, hey, everyone, just give everyone two or three minutes to write down their thoughts before we even go into a Google Doc, before we go into Mural. It's much easier to write by hand. Uh, and I think part of it is also social pressure. So if you have a small group and you give everyone a named area on your Mural or your Google Doc and you ask everyone to contribute three ideas, and you number them, everyone's gonna contribute three ideas. And if somebody's contributed one or two and you say, hey, can you give us three? They'll give you three. And so positive social pressure can be a helpful thing to use in instances like this. Ready for the next one? Oh yeah. We're born ready, right. <laughs> what do you think is the perfect number of people for a conversation to be as close as perfect? Two people? One. <laughs> well, let's break that down. Like closeness is really objective, is subjective. 
So one thing we didn't talk about at all is that one person can have a conversation with themselves, right? Even when there's one person in the conversation, there's a lot of noise going on. I assume this is not just me who has multiple voices in our head. And so being able to have an intimate and safe conversation with ourselves and all of our different voices and parts is non-trivial, it takes a lot of work. And so two people, uh, I mean, I don't know if, if you've ever been on a first date, uh, two people can have a pretty awkward conversation, <laughs> right? And so it's not about the size of the group. It's about the level of inclusion. It's really about the invitation to the conversation. And this is why people love talking about movies and food and vacations and travel. If you get people talking about a topic that they love and enjoy, we can have a very, very intimate conversation very quickly. If you ask somebody a really uh, challenging conversation or a bit of a brain stumper, it doesn't matter how small the group is, it can be really, really tough. But if you haven't seen it, and I'll put, I'll put it in the chat, there's, um, if, if I can find it, there's a New York Times article, there was some psychological research, uh, I forget the name of the researchers who did this, but it was a series of 36 questions to ask uh, an answer with someone to make you feel like you're falling in love with them. It's a, it, it's an amazing, it kind of goes from simple fact questions to feeling questions to insight and intimacy questions. And at the end of it, it really creates uh, a joining of minds. And so to me, I think it's not about the number of people. It's about the invitation. It's about the questions we ask people that frames the conversation. Perfect. I hope that's helpful. It's a really interesting question. Next question. Uh, what's the advice you would give to teams that are working remotely now and weren't before regarding their communication? Yeah, it's so important to just at least have a team charter conversation. I did a podcast interview a couple of years ago with my friend Jocelyn Ling, who at the time was the innovation uh, lead uh, at a team at, at UNICEF. I learned this from her years ago, even years before that, where we started on a project together and she had the conversation with me about, she's like, well, what's, tell me about your working style. And I was like, nobody had ever asked me that question that blew me away. This question of where do I like to work? How do I like to work? Uh, I, I really loved that question. And I was very happy to tell her that I loved spreadsheets and calendars, that that's really where I liked to have things. And she's like, oh, I'm more of a shared docs person. And uh, she was a real fan of Asana. And so we have this opening conversation of, I like this and I like this. And then we could start having the conversation about where would we like to organize our comms? This is the uh, norming, storming, performing, uh, adjourning, I'm leaving out, leaving out one of the five elements of the drexler sibit team uh, transformation model. Teams have to establish norms. So that conversation about, is it, are we on Notion, are we on Mural, or are we on Google Docs? What's appropriate to put in Slack? What's appropriate to put an email? When can I be chatted to? Is WhatsApp okay? A couple of years ago, I started just having more team conversations and more client conversations on WhatsApp, on text messages. And I'm okay with that because it creates more intimacy. But other people might feel like it's intrusive and text messages require immediate replies. And so this is about the where, when, how, and why conversation, the interface of our dialogue. Where would we like to have our conversations? It's non-trivial because people, a lot of people still don't get Slack, right? Some people, Slack feels like an email to them and other people, Slack feels like a notification that they have to reply to right away. And so establishing norms about the cadence of communication, right? What's the periodicity? How often will we be talking about what and when and where are really, really critical. It's, it's table stakes to at least have a charter of how everyone likes to work and try to find a shared way to work. One of the challenges is, is that in this time, we're not working from home. We're working in the middle of a global pandemic. 
whilst uh, at least in America, we're having a reawakening about racial inequality. So it's a really strange time to be alive. And people are stressed out. People have kids at home. Nobody was really planning for this. So this isn't working at home. This is like struggling to get by and trying to hold it together. And so having the conversation about the where and the when and the who and the how often are really, really important. That's the advice I would give to people is um, have the conversation about where you'd like to have the conversations and how often you need to have those conversations. My company is not transparent. How can I address that without putting myself in a difficult position? Is that possible since I recently joined the company? What do you think? That's such a good question. You know, this is this is a real it's a real pickle because if you feel like speaking up will get you in trouble, it's a it's a hard choice to make. Right? And so the simple answer is to find allies. Right? Find a person that you feel is safe and see if they feel similarly. It can be really hard. It takes a lot of bravery to be the first, the person to first bring that issue up. I don't know what the transparency issue is about, but building a coalition, finding a person who agrees and aligns with you, and then seeing what the next step after that is, is critical. Um, I don't know how bad it is. I mean, if this is like whistleblower level, transparent issues or public safety issues, that's where hopefully there are laws in whatever country you're messaging from that can support and protect you in speaking out. But make no mistake, even if it's not endangering your life or limb, there's a, a cost if you don't feel empowered to speak. These sorts of things really come from the top. The, the people at the top of the organization really need to be asking for the, the input. They really need to be showing that they're open to information that may not be nice for them to hear. And that's really hard to do. There's entire books written about it. Amy Edmondson's uh, work on psychological safety um, and Ed Shine in, in his book, Humble Inquiry. These are really hard ideas. It's hard for leadership to be open to critique and criticism. And so it's, the, 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 the easiest question to ask your boss or your leader is, are you open to some feedback, right? <laughs> and it's not an easy question to even ask because they might say, well, sure. <laughs> and then the question is, do you believe them? Are you willing to trust that they are open to hearing feedback? I think having that conversation one-on-one -on -one in real time is going to be a lot more uh, effective and powerful than trying to frame the right email or the perfect tweet or Slack post. And so, and, and online, this is even harder because so many conversations people are having are, are only scheduled. This is one of those conversations that's really best when you just sort of like grab somebody by the shoulder and pull them aside and say, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Uh, I was wondering if you've noticed blank. It's a little bit harder to find time for these kind of dialogues uh, remotely, but it sounds like if this is something that is bothering this guy, they're going to have to be the one to say something about it. Somebody has to be uh, the first person to create a brave space and bravery can beget other bravery and also work on your resume just to be on the safe side not to make light of the situation. Thank you so much for this answer. And can we use your advices on writing communication or does it always have to be in a normal communication? Oh, absolutely. I think this is one of the challenges of uh, written communication. Turn taking is such an important component of conversations as is cadence. And I'm sure you've seen this. I certainly have where a Twitter exchange or a text exchange gets heated because people are just responding back and forth and things escalate rather quickly. It's not possible on Twitter or on Slack to say, 
hey, can we de-escalate this for a second? Can we calm down? Like, let's rejoin. There's no eye contact. There's no physical contact. You can't say, hey, buddy, like, let's just chill out for a second. Like, this is you and me. Like, let's take a break. It's so easy to just say whatever's on your mind with no um, editing on the internet. And so uh, written communications uh, seem like they would be better for more thoughtful, thorough dialogue, but some interfaces just invite quick, rapid replies and short, terse comments that don't really lend themselves to thoughtful dialogue. And so one of the classic examples of this, you should totally Google Key and Peel. They have a skit about text message confusion where uh, one guy just thinks they're just making plans and the other guy thinks they are getting ready to have a all out battle royale fight to the death. And the uh, they only get clarity when they meet in person. Obviously, it's a hilarious exchange because it's key and peel. So yes, invitation and interface, turn-taking cadence, all of these elements still hold true in written exchanges because it's just uh, it's still a conversation. It's just a written conversation. Uh, actually, one of the my favorite examples from the book is Amanda Palmer, who wrote the Art of uh, Asking. She has a super famous TED talk. She has an example in her book of how she and her husband decided to have a note passing session during their dinner conversation. So instead of uh, talking during their dinner, they decided to pass notes with each other. And so they each got to like eat their food and think their thoughts and they just would send doodles and sketches and notes to each other back and forth. They were totally still having a conversation. But instead, they were having a written conversation. And so changing the interface changes the conversation 100%. Have that choice, have that conversation about where you have the dialogue. And this is true for distributed teams, as we talked about, like what the team decides to use to hold their conversations will shift their dialogue. Microsoft Teams and Slack are different. They enable different types of dialogue in very, very subtle ways. Zoom, Blue Jeans, and WebEx enable different types of conversations online in subtle ways. And so these digital interfaces that we use to host our conversations are not value neutral. They shape the dialogue in very, very subtle ways. And so it's worth having the conversation about where we're having the conversation and why. Thank you so much, Daniel, for this amazing talk. Do you want to say anything else to the viewers? A goodbye, maybe? <laughs> well, you know, as always, I'm happy to uh, shill for my book. Um, good talk. Just came out a couple of months ago. It is a helpful and, I mean, Dave Gray said it. I could just read what he said. I'm very pleased that he was nice enough to say this. It is a rich, thoughtful, and useful handbook for designing conversations that create meaningful change. Conversations matter right? It's literally what our lives are made out of. Designing conversations, being responsible for a team conversation and team dialogue is non-trivial. I've worked with organizations where they are going from 30 minute to 30 minute meeting. And when a 30 minute meeting goes five minutes over, it's a knock on effect that just can ruin your whole day. And so designing our team conversations, the, the time that we have together is used well is non-trivial. It's real work. It's hard to do, but it matters. So if you're out there fighting the good fight, trying to herd cats, I feel you. I feel your pain. And I applaud your efforts to, to try and get all these ducks in a row. I feel like how many, how many animal metaphors can I use in one conversation? But it's, it's real work. And I just want you to know that I appreciate everyone out there that what you're doing, I hope you can put some of these principles, simple as they are, into real practice in your work and shape your dialogues for the better. And if you want to grab a couple of chapters of Good Talk and uh, reach out and connect on LinkedIn, I'm happy to continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Daniel.